This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, good, good afternoon for the uh, New York audience, uh, good evening for people in Europe, and if anyone in California, good morning. So I hope I've covered uh, most of our membership this way. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce, uh, well, two fellow countrymen, um, Marise Blatt-Lemarcan and Ar Arnaud Suspen. So Marise um, has been working for the laboratory uh, linked to the CNRS, which is the National Center for Scientific Research in France. She works for IRAMAT as a senior engineer. Uh, she holds a PhD in physics and she's made um, a, a great name in the field of numismatics by having analyzed about anything one think one could think about. So if, uh, if one day you visit I Iramat, look at the uh, laboratories and equipment, it's very impressive, but don't lose a precious coin. It may be used for, an, for purpose of uh, archeo um, metallurgical analysis. So beware your coins. Now um, with Marise, we'll have um, Arnaud. So Arnaud Suspen is professor of ancient history at the Université d'Orléans, which is uh, um, on, on the Loire River in, in France, and is uh, associated as well with the laboratory Iramat. So together they've published quite extensively on Roman gold. Um, they, there was a conference a few years ago and uh, recently um, um, a book proceedings. Um, and I guess they're going to explain more about the relationship between archaeometry uh, and numismatics and coinage. So without further ado, Marise, Arnaud, um, you have the floor. Well, first, uh, we would like to, to thank the American Numismatic Society for having us today, and especially uh, Nathan uh, for his kind invitation and, and Jill for his introduction. So in, the, in this paper, in this talk, uh, we will present uh, new results. Um, new results for, from the elemental analysis of ancient gold coins, and uh, we will focus especially on Roman gold coinage from the Second uh, Punic War uh, to the end of the first century uh, AD, just before the present period, actually. So as Gilles said, uh, okay. As you say, there is a special reason, reason for us to, to give this talk today, because uh, last, last October, uh, we published a, a book on the, the very same topic, along uh, with two colleagues, uh, Frédéric Duira and Sylvia uh, Nieto-Peltier. As you can see on the slide, the title of the book is Aureus, the Power of Gold, and uh, on the cover, you have a, a beautiful uh, Roman gold coin uh, from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So um, the book is bilingual, uh, French and English, but uh, all the archaeometric papers uh, are in English. Uh, and the book contains uh, all the graphs uh, that uh, we will use uh, in this presentation today and many others, actually. So Aureus is uh, our last uh, opus. But uh, over the years, our team has published uh, several books on the analysis of ancient gold coins, as uh, Gilles mentioned. And uh, as you can see on the slide, too, uh, coins from Byzantium, for instance, coins from Gaul, uh, comes from Brazil, uh, even. But uh, today, we will focus on Roman coins. So um, let's start uh, with a short uh, overview uh, of uh, Roman uh, gold coinage, uh, nothing new here. So as you all know, uh, gold coins were first issued by Rome at the end of the third century BC, that is during uh, the Second Punic War. After the Second Punic War, though, uh, Roman gold issues remain scarce and uh, irregular. Uh, of course, uh, there's, uh, there are the famous Flaminian status that was striking Greece around 196 BC, but uh, they hardly qualify as uh, Roman coins. They are actually rather Greek coins. Uh, and uh, in the course of the first century BC, there were a few gold issues uh, struck uh, by and for Silla, both in the East and in Italy. And lastly, uh, a small issue was struck uh, by Pompey, uh, probably in Spain, 
in the late 70s. And then, lastly, uh, Caesar struck two small issues after the beginning of the civil war with Pompey in 48 and 47 BC. And it's only um, uh, later, uh, under Caesar's rule, that gold coinage uh, became a permanent feature of Roman coinage, especially with the issues struck by Hirtius and Plancus, the Hirtius coin is, oh, you can see my, my arrow, my, yeah. Do you see my, my arrow on the, yes. on the screen? Yes, okay, thank you. So this is a Hirtius coin uh, uh, of uh, 46 uh, BC. And then after this uh, very important uh, moment, uh, gold coinage became widespread um, during the civil wars. And uh, under Augustus, uh, it went on, of course, several mints uh, struck gold in Rome and in the provinces down to uh, 12 BC. A very important uh, step uh, was taken when uh, an imperial mint opened in Lyon uh, in 15 BC, and uh, this uh, Lyon mint uh, was probably the only mint for gold from 12 BC to AD 64. And in AD uh, 68 uh, war coinage, including gold, uh, was produced by almost all the contenders for power uh, in different places uh, in the empire. So that's that's a change of ground. So our purpose uh, here is to look uh, for the sources uh, of Roman gold coinage. That is to look for the metal used to produce all these coins. I must uh, stress. Uh, straight away that uh, we do not aim to find out about the gold mines uh, themselves. Uh, first, uh, because we do not know the fingerprints of gold ore for each mine in use in ancient times. Second, uh, because many older gold coins or artifacts were melted down to produce Roman gold coinage. So uh, looking for mines uh, would be a very bold move indeed, and I think uh, with little hope of success. But what we can do is to point out changes uh, in the composition of Roman gold coinage. And in this way, we can shed light uh, on the gold stocks used to produce gold coins at any given uh, period. And this is a way to get to the sources of Roman gold coins. So to, to achieve uh, that goal, uh, we analyze as many gold coins as possible uh, because numbers matter. And then we draw comparisons uh, between the different issues under consideration. We compare uh, Roman issues between themselves, but also uh, we compare uh, Roman issues uh, to uh, non-Roman uh, gold issues to find out about, uh, about uh, flows of uh, gold stocks, for instance. Uh, we pay special attention to gold, silver, and copper, of course, uh, but also to trace elements, and especially to platinum and palladium, because platinum and palladium, that are trace elements uh, always present uh, in gold, are uh, reliable tracer elements for ancient gold. And now it's time to, 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 to say some words about the method uh, itself. And uh, for that, I leave the microphone to Marise, uh, who will present the analysis themselves. So Marise, you have the floor. Thank you, Arno. Uh, just to say that two different methods were developed in our laboratory, the Iramat in Orléans, to determine the elemental composition of gold coins. These two methods have uh, some features in common. They are non-destructive and can analyze many elements over a wide range of concentrations. At first, proton activation analysis was applied from the early 17s until 2006 about using the cyclotron that is located in Orléans. Then the laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry that is usually abbreviated to LAICPMS has been routinely um, used since the early 2000s. In the interdisciplinary research we carry on on coins 
is made possible by a partnership with the coins, metals, and antique department of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, which lends us its coin. And now some words about LAICPMS. This method is based on microsampling made by a laser and on the analysis of the sample with mass spectrometry. When properly applied, this method has many advantages. The damage left on the coin is invisible. The results include contents of major, minor, and trace elements with low detection limits, and the composition of the core of a coin can be known as sampling goes beyond the surface layer of the coins. Lastly, LAICPMS makes it possible to analyze 15 to 20 coins a day, and it's a rather high anal analysis rate. As already emphasized, this is important as it is always better to have large sets of data so as to draw solid conclusions. As already said, the sample of coin considered for our study consists mostly of coins from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. To find out about these coins, we wrote some years ago a dedicated research program called Aureus. It was founded by uh, the Région Centre-Val de Loire in France. Thanks to this program, about 750 gold coins and artifacts were analyzed that could be compared with results from other programs such as um, PhDs or uh, special research programs. Our database currently contains more than 3,000 results for ancient gold coins. And now let's present a few results for Roman gold coinage. The full picture is to be found in the book Aureus, The Power of Gold. And now I give you back the floor, Arnaud. Thank you, Marie. So uh, first, uh, we will focus on the very beginning of Roman coinage, and, and we will uh, try to, to find out about the second Punic War gold coinage. So as you know, um, the first two uh, Roman gold issues are the famous Ocene gold issue uh, here, and the Mars Eagle uh, uh, gold issue uh, that's that are on the slide. Uh, both uh, these issues were produced at the time of the Second Punic War. So the literary sources suggest that both public and uh, private gold uh, reserves were used by Rome during the Second Punic War to, uh, to pay for this uh, gold coinage. They also suggest that uh, gold supply may have come from outside Rome. Many hypotheses uh, have been put forward over the years on, on this topic. For instance, uh, Egypt or Sicily, where Rome had powerful friends and allies like Ptolemy IV or Hero II, and uh, these uh, kings uh, might have uh, lent, uh, given uh, gold to Rome so that Rome could uh, pay for a, a gold coinage. And uh, can the analysis uh, shed a new light on this? What can they have to say about this, uh, this uh, hypothesis? So uh, on this slide, uh, uh, you can see the platinum and palladium contents of Roman gold coins from the Second Punic War. The yellow dots here, you can see my arrow, the yellow dots here are the uh, Ocean um, coins, and the red dots are the Mars Eagle coins. The yellow dots uh, were struck first, and uh, a few years later uh, came the Mars Eagle uh, coins. And as you can see on the slide, both coinages uh, belong to the same compositional group. So actually, it is impossible to tell all seen from Mars Eagle gold coins through a platinum and palladium contents. This means that the gold stock remained basically the same, 
although there might be some minor variations uh, during the Second Punic War. So, in spite of the financial stress uh, caused by the war, there was no change in the gold supply between the first two Roman gold issues. And now, uh, let's go further by making some comparisons. On this slide, uh, you will find the same yellow and red dots standing for Roman gold coins, but also black uh, dots here and here. These black dots uh, represent Ptolemaic gold coins from Ptolemy, Ptolemy the first to Ptolemy the fourth. The data come from uh, Julien Olivier's PhD and uh, were obtained using the same method and the same calibration procedure as the data for Roman coins, which is very good because we have a sound basis to make comparisons. And it is very clear uh, when you look at this slide uh, that Roman gold coins uh, of the Second Punic War do not belong uh, with the same, to the same compositional group as the Ptolemaic coins. They are, they are very uh, much apart. So, conclusion is obvious. Uh, uh, it is highly unlikely uh, that, uh, impossible even, that gold from the melting down of Ptolemaic coins uh, was used to strike the first Roman coins. So this is uh, quite a solid result and an important result too, uh, because it settles uh, an old historical debate about the support of the king of Egypt. And it is also a very good example uh, from a methodological standpoint uh, uh, of what um, analysis uh, through LI, LA ICPMS can do best. That is telling apart gold stocks used in contemporary coinages. On slide 12, on the next slide, we have plotted as well uh, a few Etruscan gold coins uh, along uh, with the Roman gold coins. So the sample this time is very small, four Etruscan coins uh, only. So, of course, uh, caution is, is, um, is required and we can go. Uh, very far with this data. But um, the Etruscan gold coins, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, do not seem to belong with Roman coins, except for one, which is here. And this, it's, it is this one on the slide. Okay, so we do not know uh, what to do exactly with such a small sample, but the results are interesting all the same because you have a group here with Roman gold coins and for the Christian gold coins, it seems to be uh, something else, something very heterogeneous too. So, uh, so much for Etruscan gold coins. But fortunately, the situation is far better for Carthaginian Punic coins. On this slide, uh, we have plotted uh, Roman gold coins and Carthaginian gold coins from the third century BC. We warmly thank uh, Jeremy Artru for uh, this graph and for the data on Carthaginian uh, coins that come from his uh, master degree. Two groups of Carthaginian coins can be seen on the graph. The dark blue, the dark blue uh, triangles uh, uh, here um, are coins struck before uh, 280 BC and the sky blue triangles here are coins struck roughly during the first Punic War between 270 and 241 BC. So, as you can see, Carthaginian coins struck shortly before and during the first Punic War, so between 270 and 241 BC, have platinum and palladium contents similar to those of Roman gold coins you are now familiar with. And conversely, uh, earlier Punic coins mostly do not, do not at all actually. You have two coins, two sky blue coins here, but it's transitional, transitional coins. But mostly the earlier coins, they do not belong with, uh, with the Roman uh, coins. So let us, cap, cap, sorry, let us keep that in mind for the moment. On next slide, uh, we have plotted gold coins struck by Euro II of Syracuse along with Roman coins. 
coins were struck for, for a euro during the first Punic War and also during the second Punic War. You can find both uh, issues uh, slide. Contrary to uh, what we saw for, Cata for Catago, uh, there is no difference here between early and late uh, euro coins. They have globally the same uh, fingerprints. But the most important result is that uh, most gold coins issued by Euro the second also have platinum and palladium contents similar to Roman gold coins. So if we bring that together, uh, we can say that obviously there is a large Carthaginian and Syracusan gold stock with the same elemental composition. And this gold stock was uh, acquired in Sicily by the Romans, uh, probably uh, during the first Punic War, where there was much looting, and maybe as well through war indemnities uh, from Carthago uh, later on. This, uh, this large gold stock was probably kept in Rome for decades, and then it was struck by the Romans uh, when they had to face the expenses of the Second Punic War. So to put it in a nutshell, that Sicilian uh, Punic uh, gold stock was the source of the first Roman gold coinage. The Romans got hold of it as a consequence of the first Punic War. Oh, well, um, this might not be the full story, but this is very important. It might not be the full story because uh, we uh, compared as well Roman gold coins to uh, Celtic gold uh, from the third century BC, uh, thanks to uh, data uh, from Sylvia Nieto Pelletier and Charlotte uh, Parizo Sillon. And uh, on this uh, slide, uh, you can see that Celtic gold coins, that, 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 the gray shapes, um, show a great variety uh, of platinum and palladium contents, particularly uh, for gold coinages from Celtic gold, which is uh, central gold. Uh, however, uh, the platinum and palladium fingerprints of some coins from gold are similar to that of some Roman coins. And uh, you can see here, there is, there is a small overlap. This makes things uh, a bit more complicated, but uh, what we should keep in mind is that uh, Celtic gold coins are very hard to date, so uh, it would be dangerous to draw uh, any firm conclusion about, about that. So now let's take a look at the overall picture. This graph uh, gathers uh, all the precedent data. It suggests that uh, some contacts uh, and uh, exchanges uh, took place in the Western Mediterranean at that time, but uh, the most important result is the presence uh, of a consistent gold stock in Sicily and Carthage and in Rome. And it is uh, with this gold stock that the, Roman, the Romans sorry, uh, made their first uh, gold coins. And well, if you want to, uh, to, to, to get more detail, uh, you can see the special uh, paper we wrote about this period uh, in, the, in the Aurelius book, uh, because the book is uh, divided into chapters, and uh, there is one that focuses on this period. Now, uh, now uh, let's um, move on uh, to the first century BC. And on this slide, uh, you can see gold coins uh, struck for or by Sulla in the 80s. Uh, mostly uh, in the east. We analyze uh, a small sample of these coins that are quite rare, or most of them, not, not all of them are rare, but most of them are, and we compare them uh, to uh, contemporary coins um, to draw comparisons, as we did uh, for the Second Punic War coins. So, here on this slide, uh, you have the results of these comparisons. And uh, on this slide, uh, several groups uh, can be distinguished. The first group uh, consists of small crosses. You, do you see my arrow uh, when I do that? Can you see it? Yes. We'll yes, OK, thank you. So uh, these this small crosses, uh, these small black crosses, they represent a Mithridatic Wars Lizimaki. That, that are this, these coins, if you want, inside. Uh, and uh, this, um, 
These coins uh, were struck by the king of Pontus uh, down to the 80s BC. The white crosses here uh, represent coins struck directly for uh, Mithridates uh, uh, himself. And there are also uh, on the graph a coin struck uh, for Mithridates in Athens. That's an Aristian coin, which is here. And uh, the famous coin of the Italian uh, insurgents, which is here. All this is a Mithridatic uh, group. There are a few uh, other coins too, but we won't comment on them uh, today. So that's the first group. The blue shapes uh, are the first as a second group. As you can see there are uh, blue dots, blue, blue squares and blue triangles on the slide. And they represent Sulla's uh, gold coins, the coins that I, I, I showed uh, on the previous slide. The elemental composition of this blue group shows some differences from one coin to another, which is not surprising given the minting circumstances. They were struck under stress when Sulla had to resort to many different sources of gold. But on the whole, on the whole, sorry, uh, they are close to Mithridatic coins. Uh, they belong to, to the same uh, composition, compositional trend. And uh, the elemental composition also resembles that of the coins represented by yellow dots. The yellow dots here. And the yellow dots uh, are gold coins struck for Brutus and Cassius, all issued in the East after Caesar's assassination. So all these uh, black, yellow, and blue shapes represent coins struck in the East in the first decades of the first century BC down to 42 BC. And they clearly, clearly seem to belong together. On the next slide, uh, for uh, moments, we, we put aside platinum and palladium, and uh, we focus on the concentration of gold uh, in cell land versus Caesarian coins. The concentration of gold is very interesting because it tells us something about the minting conditions for Sulla's issues, uh, which I'm, I mentioned uh, earlier. earlier. Uh, the coins minted by Sulla in the East contain uh, only 94 to 97% gold. That's the coins struck in the East for sure. Uh, conversely, uh, his last uh, issue uh, issued in Rome contains over 99% gold. And the same uh, gold, high gold content is to be found in the RAE struck in Rome by Caesar uh, a few decades later. So what we can see here is that uh, minting uh, conditions are clearly uh, far better in Rome than in the East. And of course, it's because the military situation of Silla uh, had uh, improved uh, in, in the meantime. Okay, you can find uh, details on the special paper uh, in, in our uh, Well, of course, uh, we must keep in mind here that um, the, 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 the sample for Silla, uh, for coins uh, from the age of Silla, uh, is not very large. So, uh, again, we must be cautious because uh, when the sample is not so large, um, sometimes conclusions are not firm enough. Let's keep that in mind. Let's now move on to the time of the Caesarian Revolution. And we will talk uh, again uh, on, the, on the next slide about Sulan coins uh, anyway. Why uh, focus on the Caesarian uh, Revolution? Uh, because it is a pivotal uh, moment in the history of uh, Roman gold coinage. It's, when that, it's then that uh, the Roman gold coinage becomes a, a regular uh, feature of Roman economy. So um, on this slide, you can still see uh, some coins uh, you have seen already. Um, the blue, black, and yellow dots that stand for coins struck in the East in the first century uh, BC that I uh, mentioned uh, earlier. But there is also uh, another group. And uh, this, uh, this other group uh, consists of red shapes. It differs uh, markedly uh, from all the from the, the other group, the, the three, the three uh, 
kinds of, uh, of coins. Palladium contents are higher, as you can see on the slide, higher palladium contents, and platinum con uh, contents conversely uh, seem to be rather lower. As you can see on the slide, uh, these red shapes uh, represent coins issued uh, for or by Caesar. And contrary to all the other coins on the slide, they were mainly struck in the West, uh, essentially in Rome. It is hard to resist here the feeling that they were made with another gold stock than all the other coins represented on the slide. So they were clearly two gold stocks, Western gold stocks used by Caesar and an Eastern gold stock used before by Mithridates, Scylla and after by uh, Brutus and Cassius. It depends on where the coins were struck. The fact that uh, the groups uh, overlap somehow uh, is, uh, however, a useful reminder that Caesar seized a, a lot of gold everywhere in the Mediterranean world during his wars. But the bulk of Caesar's gold supply did not come from the East. It's really clear. Of course, uh, Caesar's commentary uh, point towards another direction, which is Gaul, not the East, of course, uh, as the main source of Caesar's uh, gold supply. So we made comparisons uh, with uh, Celtic gold, and this is what comes uh, out of this comparison. On this slide, the red dots still uh, represent Caesar's gold coins. The gray dots here uh, represent um, sorry coins from central Gaul, and the blue dots uh, stand for coins from northern Gaul, and the results are quite striking. There is a large overlap between gold coins from Gaul and Caesarian gold coins. We'll find the details in the book, but analytical data are clearly consistent with the literary sources. Obviously, uh, Caesar got hold of a huge amount of Celtic gold, and that Celtic gold was eventually turned into array uh, under Caesar's rule. So that's a paper uh, that deals with this question. So let's now have a look uh, at the situation under Augustus. Under Augustus, uh, the situation is maybe not as, as clear-cut uh, as under Caesar. As mentioned earlier, uh, there were many means for gold in the first two decades of Augustus' uh, principates, province uh, in the west, in the east, and the different means are represented uh, on this slide by different colors. Red, for instance, is Rome. Uh, green is Spain, that's the so-called uh, Spanish means for Augustus. Uh, that's coins from Italy, that's uh, in Kaiser and Kaiser the Infidious uh, gold coins. And uh, blue uh, is the coins, uh, is uh, the mint of Lyon, sorry. From the position of the dots on the graph, uh, we can safely conclude that several gold stocks were in use uh, in the early years of the empire. Since our gold stock is still there, it would be this uh, straight uh, line, red, red straight line, but there are many others. And uh, so many gold stocks in use at the same time uh, under Augustus, uh, depending on the different means. On this slide, there is also a, an important result uh, that appears. Uh, Augustan gold coinage, whatever the means, uh, is very different from Hellenistic gold coinage. Hellenistic gold coinage uh, is represented by this green, this uh, sorry, this uh, gray uh, shapes uh, on the slide. Uh, this was pointed out by uh, in, in earlier papers, but uh, here you can see it very very clearly. And of course, this may come as a surprise especially to readers of uh, Livy and Suetonius, uh, because uh, we would expect that uh, the gold uh, permitted, for instance, would uh, be used to strike uh, Augustan gold coins. So uh, uh, 
a bit at a loss here, but the evidence is very conclusive. Um, what uh, we see is that there is a very uh, clear cut difference between uh, Hellenistic gold coinage and Augustan gold coinage. So, um, what we have to um, keep in mind, however, is that um, the um, Hellenistic gold coinage is rather earlier than Augustan gold coinage. Uh, it consists mostly of uh, Ptolemaic gold coins, but, but uh, as you may remember, uh, um, Ptolemaic gold coins uh, were not uh, struck after uh, 120 BC, so there is at least 100 years between these coins here, the latest of these coins here, and the Augustan gold coinage. So we may we may be um, cautious here too, but for every uh, kind of uh, Hellenistic gold coin that uh, we analyze, most of it, uh, we have a clear uh, difference, clear separation between Hellenistic gold coins and Augustan gold coin. Um, Let's now uh, focus uh, more closely uh, on uh, Augustan uh, coinage. And uh, if we pay attention um, to Augustan gold coinage, uh, gold coinage, sorry, we, we notice a dramatic change uh, over time. As you can see here, uh, Ori struck in Lyon, that is Ori struck uh, after 15 BC, that's uh, the blue triangles here. Um, have very low platinum and palladium contents. Before uh, the opening of, of Lyon, so before uh, 15 BC, all the other coins have higher platinum and palladium contents. So there is something happening here uh, which is very important. Uh, there is a big change uh, in the supply uh, for gold uh, under Augustus around the time when uh, the mint of Lyon opened. The first signs of this change uh, can be seen in the platinum F and uh, palladium contents of the array uh, from the so-called uh, Western mints. We can see there is a trend. So maybe the new stock was first used here and was, met, uh, was mixed with uh, all the stocks and when the mint of Lyon opened, uh, the, the new stock uh, became prevalent. So, uh, of course, uh, it would seem likely that uh, this new gold stock uh, was uh, gold from Spain. Spain was uh, seized by the Roman, was conquered by the Roman, was conquered by the Roman uh, when uh, around 19 BC. Uh, Quest was firm, and so that's about the time when uh, we see uh, this uh, the beginning of this change in the gold supply. But of course, to, to be uh, positive about that, uh, we would need uh, clear matches uh, with gold uh, from undoubted Spanish provenance. Then we could be sure, but we don't have gold from uh, from uh, firm, uh, well, from confirmed uh, Spanish provenance. Uh, we are working on it with uh, some colleagues in Spain, but up to now, uh, we don't have the proof. Sorry. So um, our last um, graph uh, also focuses on uh, imperial gold coins. It focuses on Augustan and post-Augustan gold coins uh, down to uh, AD 68, down to the, to the Civil War. It shows that uh, after Augustus, complexity returns. On this graph, our A struck before 15 BC are represented by uh, gray crosses. So that's the coins before the opening of the mint of Lyon. Augustan, <coughs> sorry, Augustan coins uh, struck in Lyon are, would be here. So they are hidden uh, by other later coins. And as you can see, there are many coins with low um, platinum and palladium contents, but, but uh, you have as well uh, coins from uh, for Tiberius, for Gaius, uh, Claudius, and so on, uh, that have higher uh, platinum and uh, palladium contents. So uh, there is more complexity. 
what can we make uh, of this uh, this graph? Well, um, there is a clear and global trend in the gold stock, uh, the gold stocks used to strike RAE under the junior clogen. So this is a trend. So maybe there was some uh, melting and remelting, as we know, um, that took place. But maybe this melting and remeltings uh, could uh, explain for this general trend. But uh, there is also new stocks, new supplies uh, that uh, appear. And uh, maybe the explanation, the explanation for this uh, new uh, supply uh, could be the exploitation of gold mines in Spain, new gold mines uh, with different uh, fingerprints uh, as the Augustus, which is very, uh, it's quite, quite possible from a ge geological point of view. And uh, in AD 68, again, <coughs> the coins uh, struck by the contenders for power are even more heterogeneous. They don't belong to any trend. Uh, they are everywhere because they, they, they strike uh, in, any, in any possible way with everything they, they have. Um, so I don't get into detail here, but uh, you can find the many, many more graphs uh, uh, in the book. So, um, I, I'm, I will present now our main conclusions uh, for the whole uh, period. And the main, main results may be that several gold supplies uh, can be distinguished in the history of uh, Roman gold coinage from the, the very beginning uh, to the uh, to the uh, period. And this is uh, historically relevant. Uh, as you can see, it helped us to understand better what uh, took place uh, during the Second Punic War. And uh, we understand better uh, what form the, the help that uh, Ptolemy the Fourth uh, gave to the Romans was, and it was not gold. Uh, it's uh, relevant uh, as well for Sulan coinage. It confirms that uh, Sulan coinage was uh, mostly uh, made with uh, the gold that uh, is seized in the East. And uh, it's uh, significant uh, also for. Caesar's coinage, because we, we saw that uh, Suetonius, uh, all the other historians were right, that uh, Caesar uh, took a lot of gold in, uh, in gold. Uh, we also um, pointed out uh, some uh, very interesting uh, results as to uh, the gold flows between the Hellenistic, Hellenistic world uh, and Rome. And the surprising part was this difference between the Hellenistic gold from the second century BC down to the second century BC and Augustan gold. These are uh, different from a chemical point of view. Uh, we um, also uh, saw that a new gold stock uh, appears uh, in the second half uh, of the Principate of Augustus, uh, the, the um, opening of the Mint of Lyon, which means that when the Mint of Lyon opened, uh, there was a, a huge uh, logistic uh, shift. It was, it was a large, large uh, administrative uh, move to a large, uh, very important administrative decision. And uh, there is this is a, an important insight into uh, the financial and monetary uh, politics of Augustus. And uh, of course, we saw that uh, later on there are many uh, other gold stocks uh, in use uh, during the whole. First century BC, uh, CE, sorry. So, uh, which means that there is not a full uh, homogeneity um, in the first uh, decades of the Roman Empire, in spite of a global compositional trend that can be explained uh, by uh, melting and, and, and remelting. So, uh, we thank you for your attention, and we uh, we thank as well uh, the many colleagues uh, that help us uh, and that contributed to uh, to this. Uh, research program. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Now we can open it up to see if anyone has an, oh, Lucia, would you like to handle the Q&A? Oh, or uh, Gilles, since uh, I, I don't know. I'm Hi, uh, Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. I don't know if there is uh, any Q&A or Gilles wants to do that. So I, I was just wanted to say hi and thank you for this wonderful presentation. This is why I, yes. Gilles. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to ask a question uh, to to uh, Maryse and Arnaud. So, no, it's it's extremely interesting to um, to look at the very little impact Hellenistic gold might have had on Roman gold, with the exception of the civil war issues in the east. So now, you know, the elephant in the room is quite obvious. We have, uh, you know, Suetonius and uh, Diocasius who describe Octavian coming back from Egypt with all the riches, you know, interest rate go down, uh, the, uh, the price of gold go, go, goes down. So it looks like Octavian didn't come back empty ended. So what yeah. happened? <laughs> well, that's, that's indeed an excellent question. Um, well, as I said, um, the Hellenistic gold coins, they were struck uh, down to the end of the second century BC. So there is a huge gap between uh, this, uh, the, the, the latest of these gold coins and Augustan gold coins. So maybe uh, the gold that was uh, kept uh, in Egypt uh, after 120 BC, and that was not coined by uh, the Egyptians, uh, was uh, lingots, ingots, or uh, maybe a jewel, something. and maybe that's what uh, Augustus sized, and maybe it was turned uh, into uh, into gold coins. So that's an hypothesis. We might say that possible because we all know, um, since uh, the work of Julien Olivier, that uh, um, the wealth of uh, the Egypt king, of the Egyptian king, sorry, uh, was not uh, what did not consist uh, mostly of gold coins, but of uh, many other kinds of riches. So uh, maybe we don't see uh, actually what was uh, what was brought back from Egypt by Augustus because he did not he did not uh, bring back coins. Maybe he bring he bring back uh, some other uh, gold um, gold artifacts. So that 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 could be um, uh, an explanation. Uh, we tried uh, in the Reis uh, book. We tried to to, make, to analyze a few a few gold um, gold rings uh, from Egypt, but the problem is that uh, they are dissertation, not not secure. So we, we do not know actually when this, uh, these coins uh, were extracted. There are there some interesting matches, but uh, we do not know. So that's a, that's a possibility. Um, the other possibility. Um, well, I wrote a paper on, on this. We, we, we should be careful about what, um, what uh, historians say uh, about uh, what happened really in, um, in, uh, in, in 29 BC in Rome. There was a, these huge triumphs. So there was many, many uh, economic, uh, economic uh, business uh, going on. And uh, maybe it could account for uh, a large part of the economic um, Phenomenon uh, and phenomena that were described by Suetonius, such as uh, the rise of the price of, uh, of uh, the land. So that could be another part of the explanation. Maybe uh, they got it wrong when they um, when they uh, thought that it was because of, uh, of the, the, the wealth from Egypt that the prices went up, especially for land. There are, there are many uh, explanations that can explain for a, a rise in prices at the time in Rome. Um, so maybe that's it. And of course, there was uh, the communication program of Augustus about this. I mean, um, uh, he made sure that everybody thought that uh, he was um, bringing back a lot of riches from Egypt. He gave, gave uh, very um, uh, spectacular uh, items to, to temples in Rome and many spoils. And so he wanted to make sure that uh, everybody thought that. So. But the analysis are here, and um, as far as uh, gold coins are concerned, there is no match. Okay, I have a um, question from Jeremy Hug, who asks, sorry, I don't want to interrupt anybody, but here this was this has been here for a little bit. Is there any subtle distinction in metallurgical composition between RRC 28 and 29 old scenes types? No, no. There, are, there is no difference on differences between these um, these two issues, and there is no differences uh, either between um, 
the status, the OSIN status, and the OSIN uh, half status. Fantastic. Well, we, we, don't, we do not have that many coins. I think we analyze only uh, um, two, uh, two half status, but that, that's a hint. That's the first step. We do, we do not have, uh, we analyze everything we could in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So maybe um, we need now um, other sources. Or maybe uh, other people can do uh, the analysis and we, we, we would, we would uh, compare our data. They have done it. Okay. Are there other questions? No? Uh, of course. I mean, we haven't had a, such a well attended long table in months, guys. There's some questions. Oh, there's a second part of the question. No, no, I, I also wanted. Uh, Okay, Jill wants to ask a question. Yes. No, I, I had no more questions. It's about the second oh. part of the question. The, uh... Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I see. I see the. We we do not have the um. The thirty uh, OSIN points uh, in the Biotech Nationale, so we we couldn't an analyze uh, any of it. We would have loved to. Uh, we would have loved to to, to just to to make sure it. Uh, to make sure they are genuine or not, you know, there is a hugely debated, uh, there's a huge debate on, on these questions. But we we, we, we do not have, um, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France uh, does not hold, held um, any any coins of this series. So, sorry, sorry, um, sorry to go back to. There, there's a follow-up question on that. Do you have any guesses about it? Wild guesses, <laughs> so I don't know. Yes. I, I don't think they are genuine, but just my opinion, and then it's not a. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I just wanted uh, to briefly interject. First of all, I'm very pleased, uh, and I've already read your article about the Siulan Gold because uh, this, of course, matches very well uh, also yeah. with what is generally taught to about the Sulan silver and all the production techniques. So this is this is perfect. I didn't get to see on the slides though, whether there is a difference, uh, not in fineness, that's evident, but in the composition of gold between the earlier and the later uh, gold, uh, Siulan gold issues. I literally did not have time to to catch uh, to catch what was on the screen. Is yeah, there a well, difference in composition, not in finance? Yeah. The graphs, the graphs are on the book, so there's no uh, G, no new graph on the on the on the PowerPoint, so you cannot find the graphs on the book. So you have time to to look at them, but we don't have that many coins. Maybe um, Marie, I'll speak under your control. <laughs> But uh, I, I, it's quite heterogeneous, and there are not many coins by um, by any series. I don't think there is a special uh, compositional group for any of them. Okay, thank you. That's uh, fantastic. Okay. And, and there is a coin that is actually a rather maybe problematic. I'm not sure. What do you think, Marise? <laughs> well, difficult to say, but uh, we can't say anything about the the coins, uh, Sulas coins uh, that, that you haven't already uh, explained to us. Uh, we can't relate uh, coins of a special time of minting or so what. Uh, thank you. We have here a very interesting question uh, from uh, Curtis. Uh, one of the slides showed that Mithridatic stators uh, uh, add similar uh, composition uh, um, to the coins of Brutus and Cassius. Was this because they seized uh, and then melted the Mithridatic gold? Well, maybe, uh, uh, well, <laughs> as we all know, as I said, everything they, <laughs> they could find to, to sign. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yes, yes, maybe Mithridatic gold, but they did not. Um, melted down uh, only coins of course they, they, uh, i think they, they did not <laughs> melt down uh, much coin actually they, they melted what they, they took from from people from temples from uh, everybody and uh, there is this um this compositional uh, eastern uh, signature fingerprint 
uh, that can be found in the Mitridatic coins, uh, both the Mitridatic uh, coins with the name of Mitridates on them and the Lysimachi uh, struck from Mitridates and uh, the, the coins of the so-called uh, libera Liberators. So, so yeah, it, it was, it was uh, one of the first things we noticed uh, with, with, um, with this analysis and we were very, um, very impressed by the, um, the consistency of this, of this uh, Eastern this Eastern group and uh, the way that uh, it doesn't look like at all the Caesarian Western group. And it makes perfect sense that uh, you can find uh, the same uh, signature in the same composition in, uh, in the Mitronid coins and in uh, Brutus and Cassius coins because through the, the literary sources, uh, we know that uh, Brutus and Cassius uh, left with a few, we left Rome in Italy with few gold that they extensively uh, looted the Greece, <laughs> Greece and, and the Asian world. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions? I do have a quick question, if I may. Hi, this is Laura from Harvard. Um, Hello, Laura. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding the methods of metal analysis do you, with the laser ablation technique, which I did not know at all, do you take only measurement in one side of the coin or more than one to create an average? And then if you take in one side, how much do you think that might impact your analysis? Marie, is it for you? Yes. In fact, we... Uh always make at least two uh, micro sampling and sometimes a third one could can be necessary but never never only one because well you, you can't avoid some uh, um, heterogeneities in in the metal and we have to check that thank you and, yeah that makes sense and, and if i may add something it's not a, a spot it's a it's drilling and it's micro drilling. It's you can see it uh, as well, but it's not at, at a given point. It's down, down the coin. So uh, and sometimes we we do more than two. You know, Marie, what, what is your record on the coin? Well, I, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a, it's good to 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 admit that uh, once I made eight. But it was very particular. I had some very problem to to analyze uh, this coin. But it was not a gold coin. No, gold is generally, uh, especially Roman gold, is quite uh, easy to analyze, and and two uh, are two micro sampling are, are sufficient. Thank you. No other uh, questions. Uh... I don't know. Are there any other questions? Uh, okay. This was absolutely amazing. So thank you very much. I mean, really, I, uh, we, I mean, personally, I'm super excited about all these uh, results. Uh, and uh, I've partly read some of the articles in your book. And uh, we're, uh, of course, we're looking forward to read the whole, uh, the whole book. Thank you, really. Thank you so much for this you, wonderful you. presentation. Eh? Really. Bye-bye. Eh? Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.